Okay, 10th graders, I'm hoping this works. I'm trying to remount my phone a little bit, but the pressure that I'm getting against my screen in my clipboard, I think it's messing up. Nope, it's recording now. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, you guys have to look at me like this. Well, what a bummer. But anyway, it's Saturday morning. I'm in rugby and um, this is not perfect, but it is something. Uh, a couple of thoughts about what we read yesterday. It was a little hard for me to read, but a couple of notable items. One is that I think it's interesting that the kids learned the nature of the crime that uh, the black men that his, their father's defending, uh, they learned it in the context of the black church. I think that's interesting that it was blacks that told him what it was. And that um, even though, the, the, uh, uh, especially uh, the girl doesn't understand, the narrator, um, Scout doesn't understand, she... It's that context. Interesting to hear, you see how the, the preacher insisted that everybody stay until they get the money that they needed. And But they are trying to support his family, even though they're nervous to spend much time because of the nature of the accusation. They're, they're, everybody's nervous about that. The other thing was what's kind of strange is that when Aunt Alexandra comes, I think she's putting pressure on her brother, Atticus, to try and, you know help these kids realize they're finches and this is uh they're they've got a legacy and kind of this family pride thing and she's she doesn't she's kind of whacked out a wacko job i think but but she's got this sense of finch pride and these kids need to know it okay and atticus tries to enforce it a little bit and then realizes he, and the kids, it's, it, it startles the kids. He's talking in ways that don't make sense. He, he's not one to kind of go the proud of yourself, proud of your family route. More, He's more humble than that. And so it's that the last chapter, chapter 13, ended with him, the kids being uncertain. Why is their dad behaving this way? And he kind of came to his senses, I think, by the end of the chapter. Anyway, we're on to chapter 14. I'm thinking I have storage in this phone, so I should be good. So I've already talked for two minutes. All right, okay, here we go. Chapter 14. Although we, had no, we heard no more about the Finch family from Aunt Alexandra, we heard plenty from the town. On Saturdays, armed with our nickels, when Jem permitted me to accompany him, he was now positively allergic to my presence when in public. We would squirm our way through sweating sidewalk crowds and sometimes hear, there's his chillin' or yonder some Finches. Turning to face our accusers, we would only see a couple of farmers studying the enema bags in the uh, Mako drugstore window, or two dumpy country women in straw hats sitting in a Hoover cart. So people are kind of talking about these kids when they come by, because their father's defending this black man is starting to gain some notoriety, and so these people are commenting about this when they see the kids. They can go loose and rape up the countryside for all of them who run this country care was one obscure observation we met head-on from a skinny gentleman when he passed us, which reminded me that I had a question to ask Atticus. Um, okay, let me repeat that quote again. This is an accusation a man is making about, about black people, I think. They can go loose and rape up the countryside for all of them who run this country care, was one obscure observation we met head-on from a skinny gentleman when he passed us, which reminded me that I had a question to ask Atticus. What's rape? I asked him that night. Atticus looked around from behind his paper. He was in his chair by the window. As we grew older, Jem and I thought it generous to allow Atticus 30 minutes to himself after supper. He sighed and said, Rape was carnal knowledge of a female by force and without consent. Well, if that's all it is, why did Calpurnia dry me up when I asked her what it was? Atticus looked pensive. What's that again? Well, I asked Calpurnia, coming from church that day, what it was, and she said uh, to ask you, but I forgot to, and now I'm asking you. His paper was now in his lap. Again, please, he said. I told him in detail our trip to church with Calpurnia. At, uh, Calpurnia. Atticus seemed to enjoy it, but Aunt Alexandra, who was sitting in a corner quietly sewing, put down her embroidery and stared at us. You all coming back from Calpurnia's church that Sunday? Jim said, yes, and she took us. I remembered something. Yes, am and she promised me that I could come to her house some afternoon. Atticus, I'll go next Sunday if it's all right, can I? Cal said that she'd come get me if, if that were if, if you were off in the car. You may not. Aunt Alexandra said it. 
I wheeled around, startled, then turned back to Atticus in time to catch his swift glance at her, but it was too late. I said, I didn't ask you. For a big man, Atticus could get up and down from a chair faster than anyone I ever knew. He was on his feet. Apologize to your aunt, he said. I didn't ask her. I asked you. Atticus turned his head and pinned me to the wall with his good eye. His voice was deadly. First, apologize to your aunt. I'm sorry, auntie, I muttered. Now then, he said, let's get this clear. You do as Calpurnia tells you, you do as I tell you, and as long as your aunt's in this house, you'll do as she tells you. Understand? I understood, pondered a while, and concluded that the only way I could retire with a shred of dignity was to go to the bathroom, where I stayed long enough to make them think I had to go. Returning, I lingered in the hall to hear a fierce discussion going on in the living room. Through the door, I could hear, hear see Jim on the sofa with a football magazine in front of his face, his head turning as if its pages contained <laughs> a live tennis match. So Jim is looking at this magazine, and his, his head's going back and forth and back and forth because he's listening to what his, his dad and Aunt, Aunt, Aunt uh, Alexander is saying. You've got to do something about her. Auntie was saying, you, you let things go on too long, Atticus, too long. I don't see any harm in letting her go out there. Cal would look, look after her there as well as she does here. Who was the her they were talking about? My heart sank. Me. I felt the starched walls of a pink cotton penitentiary closing in on me, and for the second time in my life, I thought of running away immediately. Atticus, it's all right to be soft-hearted. You're an easy man, but you have a daughter to think of, a daughter who's growing up. That's what I am thinking of. And don't try to get around it. you got to face it sooner or later, and it might as well be tonight. We don't need her now. Atticus's, Atticus's voice was even. Alexandra, Calip Calperni is not leaving this house until she wants to. You may think otherwise, but I couldn't have got along without her all these years. She's a faithful member of this family, and you'll simply have to accept things the way they are. Besides, sister, I don't want you working your head off for us. You've no reason to do that. We still need Cal as much as we ever did. But Atticus, besides, I don't think the children have suffered one bit from her having brought them up. If anything, she's been harder on them in some ways than a mother would have been. She's never let them get, with, get away with anything. She's never indulged them in the way most colored nurses do. She tried to bring, bring, up, bring them up according to her lights, and Cal's lights are pretty good. And another thing, the children love her. I breathed again. It wasn't me. It was only Calpurnia they were talking about. Revived, I entered the living room. Atticus had retreated behind his newspaper, and Aunt Alexandra was worrying her embroidery. Punk, punk, punk. Her needle broke the taut circle. She stopped and pulled the cloth tighter. Punk, punk, punk. She was furious. Jem got up and patted across the rug. He motioned me to follow. He led me to his room and closed the door. His face was grave. They've been fussing, Scout. Jem and I fussed a great deal these days, but I had never heard of or seen anyone quarrel with Atticus. It was not a comfortable sight. Scout, try not to antagonize Auntie. Here, Atticus's remarks were still rankling, which made me miss the request in Jem's question. My feathers rose again. You trying to tell me what to do? Nah, it's... He's got a lot on his mind now without us worrying him. Like what? Atticus didn't appear to have anything especially on his mind. It's this Tom Robinson case that's worrying him to death. I said Atticus didn't worry about anything. Besides, the case never bothered us except once a week, and then it didn't last. That's because you can't hold something in your mind but a little while, said Jim. It's different with grown folks. We... His maddening superiority was unbearable these days. He didn't want to do anything but read and go off by himself. Still, everything he read, he passed along to me, but with this different, different difference, with this difference formerly because he thought I'd like it. Now, for my edification and instruction. So she's feeling like Jem is kind of moving up above her, treating her more like a little kid, like she's, like, like he's the adult. I, um, gee, crawling hova, Jem, uh, who do you think you are? Now, I mean it, Scout. Oh, oh, no, she's saying this, okay. Gee, crawling hova, uh, Jem, who do you think you are? Now, I mean it, Scout. You antagonize Auntie, and I'll... I'll spank you. With that, I was gone. You damn morphodite, I'll kill you. He was sitting on the bed, and it was easy to grab his front hair and land one in his, on his mouth. 
He slapped me and I tried another left, but a punch in the stomach sent me sprawling on the floor. It nearly knocked the breath out of me, but it didn't matter because I knew he was fighting. He was fighting me back. We were still equals. Ain't so high and mighty now, are you? I screamed, sailing in again. He was still on the bed and I couldn't get a firm stance, so I threw myself at him as hard as I could, hitting, pulling, pinching, gouging. What had begun as a fist fight became a brawl. We were still struggling when Atticus separated us. That's all, he said. Both of you, go to bed right now. Ty, said it, Jen. He was being sent to bed at my bedtime. Who started it, asked Atticus in resignation. Jem did. He was trying to tell me what to do. I don't have to mind him now, do I? Atticus smiled. Let's leave it at this. You mind Jem whenever he can make you. Fair enough? Aunt Alexander was present but silent, and when she went down the hall with Atticus, we heard her say, Just one of the things I've been telling you about. A phrase that united us again. Aunt Alexandra, I don't like this woman, okay? I don't like her. One night, I think Atticus is a fantastic father, and these kids are better off with, 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 with him, and she should just go. Ours were adjoining rooms, so I shut the door between them. Jem said, Night, Scout. Night, I murmured, picking my way across the room to turn on the light. As I passed the bed, I stepped on something warm, resilient, and rather smooth. It was not quite like hard rubber, I had this sensation, but I, and I had the sensation that it was alive. I also heard it move. I switched on the light and looked at the floor by the bed. Whatever I had stepped on was gone. I tapped on Jim's door. What, he said. How does a snake feel? Sort of rough, cold. Dusty. Why? I think there's one under my bed. Can you come look? Are you being funny? Jim opened the door. He was in his pajama bottoms. I noticed not without satisfaction that the mark of my knuckles was still on his mouth. When he saw I meant what I said, he said, If you think I'm going to put my face down to a snake, you've got another think, another think coming. Hold on a minute. He went to the kitchen and fetched the broom. You better get up on the bed, he said. You reckon it's really one, I asked. This was an, a, an occasion. Our house, houses had no cellars. They were built on stone blocks a few feet above the ground, and the entry of reptiles was not unknown, but was not commonplace. Miss Rachel Haverford's excuse for a glass of neat whiskey every morning was that she never got over the fright of finding a rattler coiled in her bedroom closet on her washing when she went so, uh, to hang up her negligee. Jim made a tentative swipe under the bed. I looked over the floor to see if a snake would come out. None did. Jem made a, a, a deeper swipe. Do snakes grunt? It ain't a snake, Jem said. It's somebody. Suddenly, a filthy brown package shot from under the bed. Jem raised the br broom and, and missed Dill's head by an inch, even when it appeared. God almighty! <laughs> Jem's voice was reverent. We watched Dill emerge by degrees. He was a tight fit. He stood up and eased his shoulders, turned his feet in their ankle sockets, rubbed the back of his neck. His circulation restored, he said. Hey. Jim petitioned God again. I was speechless. I'm about to perish, said Dill. Got anything to eat? In a dream, I went to the kitchen. I brought him back some milk and half a pan of cornbread left over from supper. Dill devoured it, chewing up with his front teeth, as was his custom. I finally found my voice. How'd you get here? By an involved route. Refreshed by food, Dill recited this narrative, having been bound in chains and left to die in the basement, there were basements in Meridian, by his new father, who disliked him, and secretly kept alive on raw field peas by a passing farmer who heard his cries for help. The good man poked a bushel pod, pod by, pardon me, poked a, poked a bushel pod by pod through the ventilator. Dill worked himself free by pulling the chains from the wall. Still in wrist manacles, he wandered two miles out of Meridian, where he discovered a small animal show and was immediately engaged, engaged to wash the camel. He, he traveled with his show all over Mississippi until his infallible sense of direction told him he was in Abbott County, Alabama, just across the river from Maycomb. He walked the rest of the way. This kid is good at making up stories, okay? How'd you get here, asked Jim. He had taken $13 from his mother's purse, caught a 9 o'clock from Meridian, and got off in Maycomb Junction. 
He'd walk 10 or 11 of the 14 miles to make them, off the highway in the scrub brushes, lest, an, uh, uh, lest the authorities be seeking him, and had ridden the remainder of the way clinging in the backboard of, of a cotton wagon. Um, uh, he had been under the bed for two hours, he thought. He had heard us in the dining room, and the clink of forks on plates nearly drove him crazy. He thought Jem and I would never go to bed. He considered emerging and helping me beat Jem, as Jem had grown taller. But he knew Mr. Finch would break it up soon, so he thought it best to stay where he was. He was worn out, dirty, beyond belief, and home. They must not, they must not know you're here, said Jem. We'd know if they were looking for you. They, they uh, think they're still searching at uh, all the picture shows in Meridian? Dell grinned. Remember how he, he got some money and he wanted to go watch a bunch of movies? That's what he did. You ought to go let your mother know where you are, said Jim. You ought to let her know you're here. Dill's eyes flickered at Jim, and Jim looked at the floor. Then he rose and broke the remaining code of our childhood. He went out of the room and down the hall. Atticus, his voice was distant. Can you come here a minute, sir? Beneath its sweat streak its sweat streaked dirt, Dill's face went white. I felt sick. Atticus was in the doorway. Notice she said that Jim rose and broke the remaining code of our childhood, meaning that when you're kids you kind of keep secrets with each other, but this time he had to call in an adult, so he's no longer really a child with them anymore. Atticus was in the doorway. He came to the middle of the room and stood with his hands in his pockets, looking down at Dill. I finally found my voice. It's okay, Dill. When he wants you to know something, he tells you. Dill looked at me. I mean, it's all right, I said. You know he wouldn't bother you. You know you ain't scared of, of Atticus. I'm not scared, Dill muttered. Just hungry, I'll bet. Atticus's voice was, was at its usual pleasant dryness. Scout, we can do better than a pan of cold cornbread, can't we? we you, you fill this fellow up, and when I get back, we'll see what we can see. Mr. Finch, don't tell Aunt Rachel. Don't let make me go back. Please, sir, I'll run off again. Okay, so he was at Aunt Rachel's. Okay, that's right, his aunt was up the street. Whoa, son, said Atticus. Nobody's about to make you go anywhere but to bed pretty soon. I'm just going over to tell Miss Rachel you're here and ask if you should spend the night, if you can spend the night with us. You'd like that, wouldn't you? And for goodness sake, put on, put, put some of the, the country back where it belongs. The soil erosion's bad enough as it is. So what he's saying is you're, you're filthy dirty. You got to go clean up, okay? You got dirt everywhere. Dill stared at my father's retreating figure. He's trying to be funny, I said. He means take a bath. See there, I told you he wouldn't bother you. Jim was standing in a corner of the room looking like the trainer, trader he was. Dill, I had to tell him, he said. You can't run 300 miles off without your mother knowing. We left him without a, without a word. Dill ate and ate and ate. He hadn't eaten since last night. He used all his money for a ticket, boarded the train as he had done many times, coolly chatted with the conductor to whom Dill was a familiar sight, but he had not the nerve to tell it to invoke the rule on small children traveling a distance alone. If you've lost your money, the conductor will lend you enough uh, for dinner, and your father will pay him back at the end of the line. So normally they wouldn't let a child travel by himself, but he figured this kid must have lost his money, so there, there we go. Dill made his way through the leftovers and was reaching for a can of pork and beans in the pantry when Miss Rachel's do Jesus went off in the hall. <laughs> I love how she says it. When Aunt Rachel's do Jesus went off in the hall, he shivered like a rabbit. He bore the fortitude of her. Wait till I get you home. Your folks are out of their minds worrying. Was quite calm during the during that's all the Harris in you coming out, smiled at her. Reckon you can stay one night, and returning the hug as uh, at long last bestowed upon him. Atticus pushed his glasses and rubbed his face. Pushed up his glasses and rubbed his face. Your father's tired, said Aunt Alexandra, her first words in hours, it seemed. She'd been there, but I suppose struck dumb most of the time. You children get to bed now. We left them in the dining room, Atticus still mopping his face. From rape to riot to runaways, we heard him chuckle. I wonder what's the next two what the next two hours will bring. <laughs> so he's got this case, of course, so that's the rape. And the kids fighting, that's the riot. And now Dill shows up, the runaway. <laughs> 
he is so calm. This this Atticus is so calm. Man, I gotta take a page out of it. I gotta take a page out of his playbook. He stays calm. I'd be I'd, I'd, I I don't know what I would do. But his calm demeanor really helps calm everything else down. And puts things where they need to go. Okay. Since things appear to have worked out pretty well, Dylan and I decided to be civil to Jim. Besides, um, Dylan had to sleep with him, so we might as well speak to him. I put on my pajamas, read for a while, and found myself suddenly unable to keep my eyes open. Dylan and Jim were quiet. When I turned off my reading lamp, there was no strip of light under the door to Jim's room. I must have slept a long time, for when I was punched awake, the room was dim with the light of a setting moon. Move over, Scout. He thought he had to, I mumbled. He thought he had to, I mumbled. Don't stay mad with him. Dill got in bed beside me. I ain't, he said. I just wanted to sleep with you. Are you waked up? By this time I was, but lazily so. Why'd you do it? No answer. I said, why'd you run off? Was he really hateful, like you said? No. Nah. Didn't you all build the boat like you wrote you were gonna? He, he just said we would. We never did. I raised up on my elbow, facing Dill's outline. It's no reason to run off. They don't get around to doing what they say they're gonna do half the time. It, that wasn't it. He, they just wasn't interested in me. That was the weirdest reason for flight I've ever heard. How come? Well, they stayed together all the time, and when they were home even, they'd get off in a room by themselves. What'd they do in there? Nothing, just sitting and reading, but they didn't want me with them. I pushed the pillow to the headboard and sat up. You know something? I was fixing to run off tonight because they all because they all were. You don't want, uh, because they all, uh, I'm sorry. You don't mean to do anything. I was fixing to run off tonight because uh, uh, there they all were. You don't want them around you all the time, Dill. Dill breathed his patient breath, a half sigh. <sighs> Good night. Atticus has gone all day and sometimes half the night and off in the legislature and I don't know what. You don't want them around here around all the time, Dill. You couldn't do it, uh, do any more if they were. That's not it. As Dill explained, I found myself wondering what life would be if Jem were different, even if it was uh, from what he was now. What I would do if Atticus did not feel the necessity of my presence, help, and advice. Why, he couldn't get along a day without me. Even Calpurnia couldn't get along unless I was there. They needed me. Dill, you ain't telling me right. Your folks couldn't do without you. They must be just, uh, they must be just mean to you. Tell you what to do around uh, about that. Dill's voice went unsteadily in the darkness. The thing is, what I'm trying to say is, they do get on a lot better without me. I can't help them any. They ain't mean. They buy me everything I want, but it's now you got to now you got to go play with it. You got a room full of things. I got you that book, so go read it. Dill tried to deepen his voice. You're not a boy. Boys get out and play baseball with other boys. They don't hang around the house worrying their folks. Dill's voice was his own again. Oh, they ain't mean. They kiss you and they hug you. Um, um, good night and good morning and goodbye and tell you they love you. Scout, let's get us a baby. Where? <laughs> Remember they're going to get married? Now he wants to have a baby. <laughs> there was a man Jill had heard of who had a boat that he's, he, he rode across a foggy island where all these babies were. You could order one. That's a lie. And he said, God help him, drops him down the chimney. At least... Uh, uh, at least that's what I think she said. For once, Auntie's uh, diction had not been too clear. <laughs> when she tried to explain where babies come from, she kind of mumbled and said, oh, they come down a chimney or something like that, okay? She didn't know what to say, okay? Well, that ain't so. You get babies from each other, but there's this man too. He has all these babies just waiting to wake up. He breathes life into him. Dill was off again. Beautiful things floated around in his dreamy head. He could read two books to my one, but he preferred the magic of his own inventions. He could add and subtract faster than lightning, but he preferred his own twilight world, a world where babies slept, waiting to be gathered like morning lilies. He was slowly talking himself to sleep and taking me with him. But in the quietness of his foggy island, there rose the faded image of a gray house with sad brown doors. Dill? Hmm? 
Why do you reckon Boo Radley's never run off? Bill sighed a long sigh and turned away from me. Maybe he doesn't have anywhere to run off to. Interesting. Interesting that as they're going to sleep, she thinks of Boo Radley. Because Dill's always interested in the Boo Radley, and that's kind of what she thought of as they're going to sleep. Okay. You guys, I'm going to stop this one now and get it downloaded.